Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Mac Burr with Michelle and Associates, also known as the Rock and Walt, as you guys may have seen some of my videos already on YouTube, uh, talking about the various firearm rights restoration issues here in California. I know it's been a hot minute since I posted a video. I did want to post a new video here today. Uh, for those of you uh, that have been paying attention, last week the uh, Solana County Sheriff's Department hosted a very large conference with all of the issuing authorities here in California. Uh, specifically as far as CCW issues and Senate Bill 2 are concerned. Uh, I was, uh, of course, uh, present at the uh, at the event and was able to give a presentation both on Monday uh, as part of my post-gun laws class that I do for law enforcement, but also to give a legal update uh, to, the, uh, to the issuing authorities there regarding Senate Bill 2, some of the recent DOJ regulations that I wanted to give you guys essentially the same update so you would all have the information that I've been presenting to the issuing authorities there. But also, if you guys have general questions on Senate Bill 2 or some of the pending legislative issues, uh, that's something that uh, this video might be of interest to you. We are in for a bit of a long haul today. Uh, I will try to break this video up into segments for those of you that are interested in specific topics. Uh, but this will be a, a longer video than I've done in the past, uh, just because of the nature of the, uh, the subject will take some time to go through. Uh, so I am an attorney at Michelle and Associates. If, for those of you that haven't seen me before, uh, I am also it, running the CRPA San Jose Santa Cruz chapter. For those of you that are in the area and are interested, uh, you can reach out to CRPA uh, to potentially join our meetings. And I'm usually there. And so if you guys have any questions and you're in the area, by all means, please join us. Uh, otherwise, let's uh, go ahead and get started here. So specifically, I wanted to just obviously start, this is a legal presentation, of course. And so I just wanna make sure everyone understands that uh, a lot of the stuff in this presentation, of course, is subject to change, uh, given that depending on when you actually watch this video, uh, California does have a nasty habit of changing the laws uh, on a regular basis, on an annual basis, generally speaking. And of course, the California Department of Justice with its regulatory authority generally adopts various regulations throughout the year. Uh, so just be aware that a lot of the stuff in this presentation is potentially subject to change, especially given that uh, the implementation of Senate Bill 2 by the issuing, issuing authorities is sort of just getting started here uh, this year. So a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about potentially could change at some point in the future. So just real quick, uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with some of the recent changes to California gun law. I just wanted to obviously give a quick overview of some of the changes that we've seen this year. Uh, of course, Senate Bill 2, which I'll be talking about in detail here today. We also have Assembly Bill 28, which is the Firearm and Ammunition Excise Tax, which will begin July 1st, 2024. Uh, and AB 1483, which is now limiting uh, firearm purchases every 30 days for all types of firearms here in California. There are, of course, some exemptions that potentially you can make use of. For example, if you have a CNR license, FFL, in addition to a certificate of eligibility, uh, you would be exempt from that specific restriction. And then, of course, Senate Bill 14, uh, 452, which was a result of our lawsuit in Bolin v. Bonta, which successfully overturned California's micro-stamping requirements. However, of course, Shortly after that lawsuit was able to achieve an injunction and the California Department of Justice decided to abandon its defense of the micro stamping requirement in its current form, the California legislature enacted uh, Senate Bill 452, which is going to basically make micro stamping its own standalone provision separate from California's roster. Uh, but there are of course other bills that were enacted. I won't go over these in detail. Uh, if you have more questions about any of these, I'd encourage you to check out the CRPA website as well as the California Gun Laws book, which goes into all of the new laws for 2024 in detail, which I'll post a link here uh, at the end of the presentation. There are, of course, a number of pending bills uh, this year. Uh, I've just issued, I've listed out a few of these here. This is not the complete list of bills that the CRPA is tracking as far as uh, it, through its lobbyists and, and lobbying efforts uh, here in California. The one that I did want to call special attention to, of course, is Senate Bill 1160, which if those of you are not familiar with that, uh, this would basically be a complete overhaul to California's firearm database systems. Uh, so for those of you that have purchased a gun, you're probably familiar with the DROS process here in California, where basically in addition to the 4473, 
you have to fill out what's called a dealer record of sale. That form is transmitted to the California Department of Justice and it serves two general functions. First, it is used to conduct the background check uh, as required for all firearm transactions. In addition to that, it creates an entry into what's called the AFS system, or Automated Firearm System, uh, which is the database that the Department of Justice has uh, that is the record of all of the transactions that have taken place here in the state of California. And this becomes important uh, as far as SB2 is concerned, which we'll be talking about here shortly, because in order for you to apply for and obtain a CCW, any of the guns that you want to have listed uh, on, your, on your CCW have to be reflected in this AFS database. And so Senate Bill 1160 is going to completely overhaul that database and create a new database called the Registered Firearms File, uh, which will now require, among other things, that you pay an annual registration fee for those guns that are not registered in the system, they will have to be surrendered and destroyed, or at least the law will require that. And violations for failing to record or register firearms are subject to infractions with a $1,000 fine. Before I get into Senate Bill 2, I just want to give a quick overview of you know, why it came into, came into being here in California. Of course, in 2022, we had the landmark decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin which was a challenge to New York's licensing requirement as applied to uh, good proper cause, which is effectively the same as California's quote unquote good cause requirement for the issuance of a CCW. And almost in just a few weeks after that decision was handed down, the California Attorney General issued a, a, a legislative, or I should say a, a, a legal alert to law enforcement agencies that they can no longer enforce California's good cause requirement. Uh, part of this case, the, the real, I should say, the real two takeaways from this case is that first and foremost, it makes clear that any subjective requirement on the issuance of a CCW, should the state choose that method to allow its citizens to carry, uh, is unconstitutional. And so in the case of New York's proper cause requirement, it was found to violate the Constitution by preventing law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs from exercising their right to keep and bear arms. But more importantly, it established a, I think, more importantly, it establishes two A litigation framework that we didn't have before. And in the Ninth Circuit, it rejected the two step test that the Ninth Circuit was using to analyze questions uh, involving Second Amendment issues. And so instead, it's now requiring courts to analyze firearm related questions in a manner consistent with the Second Amendment's text and historical understanding. So we've already seen some significant impacts of that decision, particularly in uh, May v. Bonta v. One, but also some of the other pending cases that we have here in the state of California, as well as some of those cases nationwide. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on some of the pending litigation that we have, but I did want to call out the two, Duncan v. Bonta and May v. Bonta, both have injunctions currently in effect, and I'm going to go into more detail on the injunction as applied to May v. Bonta and how it applies to Senate Bill 2. So let's go ahead and dive into Senate Bill 2 now. So generally speaking, this was, of course, an overhaul to California CCW requirements. The good cause and good moral character requirements have now officially been repealed. There are now new disqualifying criteria that are outlined in Penal Code Section 26202. And of course, in order to obtain a CCW, as long as you're not subject to those disqualifying criteria, and you're at least 21 years of age, you have a valid California driver's license or ID, and you are the recorded owner of any of the handguns for which the license will be issued, meaning that those guns are listed in DOJ's AFS system, you should be issued a CCW. It does impose specific investigation requirements on issuing authorities, but I'm not going to go into detail on those in too much, largely because regardless of what those requirements are, in order to deny you or be able to lawfully deny you a CCW, it's still going to have to go back to those disqualifying criteria that are outlined in Penal Code Section 26202, which I'll go through here in a minute. But in addition to this, Senate Bill 2, of course, established prohibited areas where CCW holders may carry their firearms. And of course, the May case sort of put an injunction on, on, on a lot of that. And then last but not least, it established a court of appeals process for a court court appeals process, I should say, for denials 
and revocations should you be denied for whatever reason. And I'll, and I'll go through the process on how that applies to you here uh, shortly. One thing I do wanna point out is that if you submitted your application prior to January 1st of this year, the licensing authority must apply the statutory requirements in effect as of the date of the licensing authority received the completed application. So what this means is that if you completed everything and are just waiting for the issuing authority to approve or deny your CCW, but everything was submitted to them prior to January 1st, you should not be, uh, the, your, your eligibility for a CCW should not be determined under the new standards imposed by Senate Bill 2. You should be determined based off of the statutory requirements prior to the enactment of SB2. So this could, for example, mean that you would still be subject to California's good moral character requirement. But going back to uh, the New York Supreme Court case, that regardless of whatever requirement the issuing authority wants to impose on you, it cannot be subjective in nature. So just keep this in mind that if you're, if you're waiting for the issuing authority to determine whether or not your license was issued, it should be determined based off of the statutory requirements prior to Senate Bill 2. And that can include, and that should include, I should say, the requirements as far as training is concerned. And that becomes very important here when we talk about the DOJ CCW trainer requirements and how that, that overhaul has, has placed, should I say, significant roadblocks on how one becomes a certified trainer that, it, that is able to teach the required CCW course. So because those statutory requirements were not in effect up until, until January 1st, that is not something that you should be subject to, which means that you should be able to get your training from any prior issuing authorities approved CCW instructor. So going into the disqualifying criteria that's outlined in Penal Code 26202, uh, the first is that in order to be disqualified, the first criteria listed there is that you it must be shown that you were reasonably likely to be a danger to yourself or others based on the contents of the application that you submitted or as shown by any psychological assessment. Now, again, the problem that I have with this is that this is essentially very subjective, or it could be interpreted as being very subjective. So how this actually gets, this, this gets enforced, or I should say how it gets applied by issuing authorities uh, remains, remains to be seen. But nevertheless, just be aware that you know, it is something that the issuing authorities are still going to have to base this decision off of objective criteria. So what that means here, how it's applied to this particular criteria, uh, is uh, remains to be seen. The next one is that you've been convicted of contempt of court. Pretty straightforward. If you have a prior conviction of being convicted of contempt of court under the disqualifying criteria, that would be grounds to deny you or revoke your CCW for whatever reasons. Uh, and so whether or not this is something that's ultimately held as constitutional with all of these disqualifying criteria remains to be seen. Uh, these specific re requirements will most certainly be subject to a court challenge at some point, whether it be on an individual basis as applied to specific situations or uh, you know, as a broad constitutional challenge. Uh, but nevertheless, just be aware that that is a potential issue for individuals if you have such a conviction on your record. The next one is that you were the subject of any restraining order or protective order unless the order expired, was vacated, or otherwise canceled more than five years prior to the application. And this particular criteria lists out these following types of restraining orders here in the state of California that would trigger this restriction. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that we have already seen people get denied based off of this particular criteria even in the situation where the individual was the subject of a temporary order that once they actually went to court and due process was provided to them, that restraining order was then still dissolved or found to be without merit, without warrant kind of thing. And so uh, the, the actual disqualifying criteria itself doesn't specify that it has to be one that was ultimately determined to be valid and actually a permanent order of some type for up to five years was issued. And so this is a 
going to be a significant problem and of course something that I think is going to be definitely subject to some kind of challenge given that uh, in situations where the issuance of such an order can be issued uh, under a very low burden of proof uh, here in the state of California. Going further, the next criteria, if you were convicted of any of the following offenses in the past 10 years, which includes interference with civil rights or hate crime, they list those specific penal code sections there, or any specified offenses or outstanding warrants resulting in a firearm prohibition as listed in penal code section 29805. Penal code section 29805 is the list of misdemeanors in California generally that prohibit a person from owning or possessing firearms for a 10 year period. That can include things like battery, uh, assault, stuff like that, uh, that California, based off of its own infinite wisdom, imposes an additional 10-year restriction should you suffer any type of conviction under those code sections. Next criteria, if you are engaged in unlawful or reckless use, display, or brandishing of a firearm. Again, going back to New York's, uh, the New York Supreme Court case, uh, this does not, if you read this carefully, does not require any sort of conviction. And so what it means to be engaged in such, such activity is largely subjective. And so I would expect that if this is an issue, uh, that that would be something that would, of course, be subject to some sort of challenge uh, moving forward. You can also be disqualified if you're convicted of any offense listed in Penal Code Section 290-6675, 1192.5, 1192.7 or again, 29805 in the past 10 years, but that was dismissed pursuant to a plea or dismissed with a waiver pursuant to People v. Hari. Uh, this is potentially an issue, obviously, depending on your particular situation, if you had such a conviction. So if you do, or if, or if you're not sure if this applies to you, uh, feel free to reach out and we will be happy to review your, your criminal records for you and, and give you a better understanding of whether or not this particular criteria would apply in your circumstances. Another one, if you've been committed, incarcerated, on probation, parole, post-release community supervision, or mandatory supervision for a conviction involving controlled substances as defined in the Health and Safety Code sections 11053 through 11058, or alcohol. So depending on whether or not that would apply to you, of course, again, we're talking about essentially some sort of uh, conviction that involves some sort of probation, parole period, or something like that, or some sort of uh, physical or mental health treatment potentially uh, under those specific code sections uh, that would, uh, in this case, trigger a restriction on a person obtaining a CCW. There is, of course, again, sort of tied to that uh, someone that is currently abusing controlled substances or alcohol. Now, I think that this one's kind of unnecessary, largely because under federal law, if you are currently addicted to or, or unlawfully using any controlled substance, uh, that would be a prohibition on owning or possessing firearms. But it's this last bit here that involves or alcohol. What that actually means, of course, is going to be, I think, largely subjective. And so, again, I would expect that that would be something that would be subject to potentially a court challenge of some type. You could also be denied if you experience the loss or theft of multiple firearms due to a lack of compliance with federal, state, or local laws in the past 10 years. Uh, what that means, like, does, does that, for example, require that you be convicted of a violation of state, federal, or local firearm storage requirements? It's not clear. So, it remains to be seen how that's actually going to. Uh, be applied. And I think that potentially if, if you have a jurisdiction that's that's more keen on denying people any way that it possibly can, uh, that is something that could potentially be subject to challenge. And then lastly, if you fail to report the loss of a firearm as required by federal, state, or local law. So in California, if you uh, lose or misplace or your firearm is stolen for whatever reason, uh, Proposition 63, enacted in 2016, generally requires you to report the loss or theft within five days to local law enforcement. Uh, if you noticed on the pending le legislation that I showed you earlier, there is a bill that is uh, trying to limit this further to two days, but it remains to be seen, of course, if that actually gets enacted and whether or not that's uh, something that is uh, upheld, should it be challenged. 
So going now to the required training. So Senate Bill 2 did modify the requirements uh, as far as the training that you must undertake in order to obtain a CCW. Previously, the minimum requirement was that it be at least eight hours in length for initial courses. Uh, now it's 16 hours and eight hours for renewals. So if you're a first time CCW applicant, the course that you take will generally have to be a 16 hour course. And then of course, if you're renewing it, it'll have to be an eight hour renewal course. Now remember, if you submitted your application prior to January 1st of this year, you should be subject to the training requirements as an effect prior to January 1st. So it'd be half the length generally for both of those. The course must include a live fire shooting exercise of some type, and you must demonstrate safe handling and proficiency with all of the firearms that you are applying for. And so for example, if you are wanting to list a gun on your CCW by through the amendment process or something like that, you will have to go through the required training to demonstrate the shooting exercises and safe handling and proficiency with that specific firearm that you want to get listed. So just because it's the same caliber or same type of gun doesn't mean that you'll necessarily be able to get it listed without going through the training. So just be aware of that if for those of you that are applying for a CCW and you may want to add a gun at some point in the future. The course must also include instruction on the following, following um, subjects, and that includes firearm safety, firearm handling, shooting techniques, safe storage, legal methods of transport and securing firearms and vehicles, the laws governing where permit holders may carry, the laws regarding permissible use of a firearm, and the laws regarding permissible use of lethal force. At some point, I'm hoping I could potentially do a video here uh, regarding the permissible use of lethal force in California. I've, I've been training now for a while, and it's, uh, I've, I've provided that uh, specific instructional course uh, to CCW applicants in the past. And so hopefully at some point, I'll be able to put a video together that potentially, for example, could be used uh, for these types of courses. The one thing I wanna caution instructors on, for those of you that are CCW instructors, You've got to be very careful about providing legal advice to your students. If you, you yourself are not an attorney or otherwise authorized to practice law. Um, and so for that reason, for those of you that are uh, thinking about putting a course together or something like that, I would strongly encourage you to uh, utilize a, either a law enforcement officer resource that would potentially come out and instruct your students on this particular aspect that's required under the course or potentially an attorney, uh, should you be able to. The new SB2 requirements also mandate at least one hour of the course be dedicated to mental health discussion of some type. This is not specifically laid out as far as uh, anything what's required under the mental health training. And so if, you, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, I would say a great resource would be something like uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, David Grossman, uh, he's done a couple books on that you can you can look them up the on combat, uh, you know that kind of thing that that talk about sort of the mental, uh, not only the impacts of being involved in in a use of force situation, but also the after effects and potentially how it could affect someone from a mental health perspective. Uh, I would like to see something like that put together that again potentially these CCW instructors could use as part of their class because note that the while this class must now generally be taught by a DOJ certified CCW instructor, this mental health component at the very least doesn't have to be taught specifically by the CCW instructor. And I would argue that that would also be the case regarding any instruction concerning laws governing uh, you know, where, the, where you can carry the use of a firearm and the use of lethal force because California does have other restrictions, for example, under the Business and Professions Code that prohibit someone from engaging in the practice of law unless they're authorized to practice law. And then lastly, of course, students must pass a written exam as part of this course. So under the new requirements of SB2, issuing authorities must charge a fee in the amount equal to the reasonable processing costs of the CCW application systems that they have set up. I asked broadly to the CCW issuing authorities that were in the conference, uh, there were only you know, two or three counties that raised their hands that said that they actually track what their processing costs are. So 
depending on the county, of course, the fees uh, might be significant, might vary significantly. This is something that is subject to litigation uh, as it stands right now. The CRPA, the LA LASD, and Bonta lawsuit is challenging, for example, high processing fees uh, that some of these jurisdictions have imposed. Usually I'm seeing these fees are pretty exorbitant uh, in certain city jurisdictions. I'm not seeing them too high, or at least sh should say significantly higher than what some of the cities are charging when it comes to the specific counties. Uh, but just generally speaking, only the first 50% of whatever fee they charge can be collected when you actually submit the application and then, of course, the remaining 50% can only be collected if they actually issue your license. An important thing that a lot of people don't understand, or at least that there seems to be some confusion on, is that the psychological assessment is an option. It's not a requirement that the issuing authorities uh, impose that on their CCW applicants. So if it is imposed, however, uh, one important thing to note here is that it's no longer required under SB2 for the issuing authority to use the same psychologist that their own law enforcement officers uh, were used as far as their application to become a law enforcement officer. So now it can be any licensed psychologist, psychiatrist, as long as the uh, issuing authority approves the use of that particular medical professional to conduct the exam. And then, of course, there used to be a $150 statutory fee that was capped uh, uh, as far as how much an, an applicant would have to pay for this. That has now been replaced with a requirement that they may only be charged the actual processing cost for whatever that exam actually costs. It, it should also be noted that if an issuing authority imposes an additional psychological exam, they can do so but only if there's compelling evidence of a public safety concern. And so how that actually will ultimately play out, of course, will remain to be seen. I have not yet heard specifically of anybody being required to undergo an additional psychological exam, uh, obviously for, you know, you could think about it from the practical reasons that, you know, persons that has a CCW, uh, they shouldn't actually, uh, they should be one of the most law-abiding types of people uh, in, in the world for that matter. So. I wouldn't expect that there'd be a lot of situations, if, if any, where someone would be required to go an additional psychological exam because of some public safety concern that the issuing authority may or may not believe exists. Okay, so those are the specific requirements. Let's now look at, let's say you're denied, you know, what happens in those situations. So if there's, 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 there's effectively, there's two processes that are available and it depends on why you were denied. The first is if you were denied because you were determined to be disqualified under Penal Code Section 26206. And so in this situation, you must be notified by the issuing authority uh, why you were denied and that you may, as a result of that denial, request a court hearing. Uh, they should provide you with a form that's, that is titled Request for Hearing to Challenge Disqualified Person Determination Form, which I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Uh, you will then have 30 days to file that with the court of your county in, in which you reside, uh, should you so wish to challenge the determination for the denial or revocation. Uh, it should be noted here that, of course, some, uh, some issuing authorities may impose their own internal appeal process, which they could, for example, require you to go through prior to submitting this, uh, submitting this appeal uh, to the court. Uh, but just generally speaking, there's a time limit that that must, whatever that internal process is, must be resolved within 60 days. At the conclusion of that appeals process, that's when you'll have, that's when that 30 day period will begin to toll. And that's when you'll, that's the window that you'll have to then challenge it with the court. When you're actually in court in this particular process, uh, the court should set a hearing within 60 days, notify you, the issuing authority, the DOJ, and the district attorney. The district attorney will act as the plaintiff here and just note that the DA will be entitled to a continuance, meaning that they can, even though with the hearing set within 60 days, they can ask for an additional 30 days prior to, um, uh, prior to actually going forward with the hearing. Regardless of, of when that happens, however, uh, once the court sets a hearing date, the DOJ must file your criminal history under seal within 14 days 
And the issuing authority must also file any records or reports on which it relied to deny or revoke the license. Now, one thing that I, I should point out here is that I generally suggested to issuing authorities that will be doing this, that they need to be very careful about how they file that because as applied to the issuing authorities here, there's nothing that specifically states that it must be under seal. Uh, and so uh, I made sure to, that they understood that uh, they need to be careful about violating the rules of court regarding protection of privacy, particularly because what we're talking about here effectively is your criminal history, something that is not something that should be subject to public record. Uh, but also any other material and relevant evidence that's not excluded under the evidence code can also be considered uh, by the court in this process. The district attorney here actually bears the burden to prove by quote unquote a preponderance of the evidence that you are actually disqualified pursuant to 26202. If they fail to meet that burden or the district attorney for whatever reason decides that they don't wanna challenge this, uh, the court should then order an application, order that your application for a CCW to proceed, or if your license was revoked, reinstated with the original expir date, expiration date extended accordingly based off of when the court issues that order. So basically they're going to say that your CCW was valid for two years. Uh, there was this point in time where it was revoked. Uh, that period during which it was revoked and ultimately when the court decided to reinstate it is not going to... Um, uh, is not going to affect the total length and time in which your CCW is valid. So you, your CCW basically will be extended for however long um, you, uh, that process took. At that point, however, the DOJ must then confirm your eligibility to own or possess firearms. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, I can see this being sort of a circular issue where you were originally denied or should I say, uh, rejected a CCW application because, for example, you might have a criminal history that resulted in an undetermined eligibility uh, from the California Department of Justice. And then you were then going through the process of challenging it, and now DOJ has to go back and do the same background check. What happens if this comes back as undetermined again? Um, so that's going to be an interesting issue, depending on how that works out, and hopefully would be uh, something that res gets resolved in subsequent litigation at some point. If, however, the people do meet their burden, uh, they will basically succeed at denying your application under that, at that point, and the court will inform you that you can file a subsequent application with the issuing authority no sooner than two years from the date of the hearing. So basically, it's a temporary two-year prohibition on applying for a CCW. Now, you could potentially challenge the lower court's determination here uh, I would advise you to uh, seek assistance of counsel to determine whether or not that's something that you should be doing and, of course, what that might entail. This is what the actual form looks like, where if you were to be denied based off of disqualifying criteria under 26202, this is the form that you would fill out and file with the court to challenge that. If you note here, there's two boxes which you can check which you can basically say that you request to review denial or revocation of a new license, or you request a confidential private hearing. I would encourage you that if you're looking at this, at, at doing this, always request the confidential private hearing just to keep your personal records and private information private, uh, depending on, of course, whether or not the court will, will accept that or not will remain to be seen. But nevertheless, given the nature of these types of hearings, I would expect most courts, most district attorneys won't have issue with conducting a confidential hearing given the nature of the, of the, of the, uh, of the case. So that's the first court process where if you're denied based off of someone determining that you're disqualified pursuant to penal code section 26202, there is also another court process that's now been established, or I should say but that's been laid out under the statutes. For those individuals that are denied, either because they're under 21, uh, they were determined to not be a resident of the city or county in which they're applying, they failed to meet the required training, or for example, they don't have the AFS record on file uh, to get the CCW for their particular firearm. If you're denied for any of these reasons, Senate Bill 2 requires you to, instead of filing that particular form that I just mentioned, 
to instead file a writ of mandate action pursuant to the Code of Civil Procedure to challenge that denial. Uh, this is again, something that must be filed within 30 days after you're notified that your application was denied or revoked. And of course, again, issuing authorities may impose their own internal appeal process prior to you uh, filing a challenge uh, in a court along these lines. Senate Bill 2 also imposed prohibited activities while you're carrying. So for those of you that have had CCWs before, you might have seen this uh, as far as a DOJ form that was uh, you were required to sign and basically acknowledge that you cannot engage in certain activities while you're actually carrying your CCW. I've listed them out here. Uh, this is something that uh, obviously could be at some point subject to challenge in the future, but basically what this is saying is that you can't engage in any of these activities listed here while you're actually carrying a firearm. And now this is, uh, prior, previously prior to Senate Bill 2, this was not something that was uh, imposed via any sort of statutory or regulatory requirement, but now as a result of Senate Bill 2, this has now been codified in Penal Code Section 26200. Senate Bill 2 also imposed its own version of quote unquote sensitive places where a CCW holder is prohibited from carrying. But before I go into this in detail, we of course had the Maybe Bonta case, which challenged this in court. Uh, and, and fortunately we were able to obtain an injunction, which although the Ninth Circuit temporarily stayed, the Ninth Circuit later dissolved that stay and so as a result of that, the injunction is currently in effect while the case is pending. So this particular injunction prohibits the enforcement of specific sections in Senate Bill 2 as applied. And so this is what this looks like. And so should, we, should this injunction not have been issued, all of those places listed there would have been prohibited uh, for you as a CCW holder from carrying in any of those areas. However, now as a result of this injunction, uh, you'll see those uh, those particular sections there have been uh, put on hold, so to speak, and so you cannot be found to be violating this restriction uh, in those areas that are that are crossed out there. One other thing that I want to point out, though, is there there are of course a number of areas that are listed here that are still subject to prohibitions, and I think the legislature, of course, being California, uh, enacted a number of of uh, areas here that are already subject to their own specific restrictions in one form or another on carrying a firearm in those areas to begin with, regardless if you have a CCW or not. And so, you know, why, for example, the legislature felt the need to prohibit you as a CCW holder from carrying in a federal nuclear regulatory commission property, which is federal property and your California CCW wouldn't apply anyway, you know, it, it's, it just kind of goes to show that the legislature a lot of times doesn't know what they're doing when it comes to enacting laws along these lines. So just note that, yes, there are still a number of areas that you're prohibited from carrying that are still in effect. But, you know, generally speaking, these are areas that you wouldn't be able to carry in the first place, regardless. So that being said, you still have the authority under Senate Bill 2 pursuant to section 26230 uh, to transport firearms in certain manners uh, based off of if you're going to those areas that are prohibited or going through those areas kind of thing. Uh, the, these provisions sort of lay out what you can do. And so, for example, you can transport the fi your firearm or ammunition within a vehicle in or out of the parking area so long as the firearm is in a locked box. You can store ammunition or, or a concealed firearm in a locked box out of plain view in the vehicle in the parking area and transport a concealed firearm in the, in the immediate area surrounding the vehicle for the limited purposes of, purposes of storing or retrieving a firearm. So for example, if like you're going into the post office, that kind of thing, uh, or, or, or I, sh I shouldn't say post office because that's federal property, but any place that potentially is prohibited that is in California, under Senate Bill 2, uh, this is sort of laying out what you can do as a CCW holder. Now, of course, you still got to be very careful about, for example, if you're taking your firearm out of your holster and you're putting it into your, you know, your lock box or, or, or whatever method you have storing the, the firearm in the vehicle. And you want to make sure, of course, that you're not 
uh, exposing that firearm or yourself in that situation to other individuals that may be in the area that may, for example, see you doing that and, you know, get concerned, call the police, that kind of thing. And that could still, of course, cause a law enforcement response and, and not be good for anybody in that situation. So just be very cautious about should you be doing this uh, for whatever reason, uh, should you have to. The California Department of Justice has, of course, adopted regulations uh, implementing various provisions of Senate Bill 2. These regulations, although we submitted an opposition letter, some of you may have seen, uh, were nevertheless approved by the Office of Administrative Law here in California on January 2nd, which means they are, they are now in effect as of that date. And so this adopts a number of sections uh, regarding, uh, first and foremost, D DOJ certified instructors. So as part of these regulations, in order to be able to teach the required CCW course, DOJ is now requiring you, or I should say requiring CCW trainers to obtain a special certificate that's issued, that's issued by the California Department of Justice. In order to obtain that certificate, generally speaking, you have to have a certificate of eligibility, be at least 21 years of age and have a valid California real ID, meaning that your California driver's license or identification card has a uh, the, the gold bear with the star on it to indicate that you are lawfully present in the United States. If you don't have a real ID, you'll have to provide supplemental documentation to the DOJ indicating that you are lawfully present in the United States. Applicants generally must also be certified by one of the following. Either the Bureau of Security and Investigative Services as a firearms training instructor, California Post, as a firearms instructor or range master, or a state accredited, accredited school to teach a firearm course. Now note that this last one here is not expressly defined. I've asked the Department of Justice repeatedly what this last state accredited school option means, and the Department of Justice has not answered or provided any sort of guidance whatsoever as far as what that means. And so what we're seeing is, is that in order to become a CCW instructor and be issued the required credential, generally speaking, you either have to go through the, you be a BA, BSIS firearms training instructor or a post firearms instructor or range master. There are certain jurisdictions out there, such as uh, Riverside, that have uh, thankfully opened up their post firearm instructor range master course to civilian CCW instructors. Uh, I myself am, am looking forward to doing that here uh, shortly. And so it, it is a bit of a bit of a process. It's a bit of a hurdle. It's a four day course from what I understand, uh, potentially five days, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and the good news is at least it's a, it's a one-time course. So it's, it's a lifetime certification if you get that basically, but nonetheless, uh, this has proposed, this has been a bottleneck, uh, as far as some, uh, issuing authorities are concerned to be able to provide the required training. So hopefully that's going to start opening up here. If that does become an issue for individuals obtaining a CCW, for example, that would be something that would potentially be subject to litigation. And for example, we might amend the lawsuit in CRPA VLASD slash Bonta to challenge that. As in addition to that, in addition to the certification, Applicants must also pass a live fire shooting qualification uh, within the past six months. That the generally that qualification can be issued by BSIS or a post firearms instructor, but in addition to that, a number another number of other options here. But just know that this is a separate requirement from the requirement that the individual be certified as a firearms training instructor or range master, either from BSIS or post. And so I've seen issues where applicants have submitted their application to the DOJ to become a CCW instructor and they, and they got these two things confused and thought, for example, that uh, just be, because you passed the live fire qualification that meant by a, the live fire qualification that was issued by a post firearms instructor, that it also meant that you were certified as one of those instructors. And so that those applications have been getting rejected. And so I wanna make that clear that, that these two requirements are separate and distinct from one another because that's where some people are getting confused on this. This certification, should you obtain it, is valid from the DOJ for four years, but of course your COE must still be updated annually. It is, be, it is possible to have your, uh, your CCW training instructor credential revoked 
uh, which will also then result in a one-year prohibition on reapplying. And then, of course, lastly, if you are an active or honorably retired law enforcement officer that is certified as a post instructor, you are not required to obtain the DOJ certification uh, by nature of your status as an active or honorably retired peace officer who is also a post firearms instructor. So that means that those individuals will not actually have to obtain this certification from DOJ uh, to be able to provide the required training. There are a number of reasons why uh, your certification can be revoked. Uh, for example, you made false statements on your application, you failed to meet the minimum standards or include the required instructions or you know, a written exam, that kind of thing. Or this last one, which public safety may be endangered if the instructor will retain their certification. What that means, it's again, unclear. Uh, but the key, thing, key takeaways here is that any person can notify DOJ if they think someone's instructor certification should be revoked but any rev revocation action by DOJ will be conducted under the Administrative Procedures Act. So there will be a, a quasi type hearing in which the instructor will be able to challenge uh, any, any evidence or anything that's been brought against them as far as why their, uh, why their certification should be revoked for any reason. This is what the application form looks like. This is available on DOJ's website. I'll post a link to that uh, here, on the, here on the video as well. Um, you'll have to fill out this information, uh, but this is just the top half of it. So just be aware that if you're looking to become a CCW instructor, you'll have to fill out this form and in accordance with the instructions that's laid out there and the uh, procedures that I just laid out. The regulations that DOJ adopted also briefly touch on background checks and a few other issues here. So just generally speaking, of course, you must submit a live scan uh, as a CCW applicant if you're uh, seeking a CCW. Uh, for initial applications, DOJ will examine the state records as well as the NICS, National Instant Criminal Check System, uh, to determine an applicant's eligibility. And basically for renewal, it'll sort of do the same thing, but this is just laying out what, what specifically DOJ will do as far as the background checks are concerned. If someone is denied, and then it's sub subsequently that denial is reversed by a court order, this section will actually uh, lays out what DOJ will do uh, here in these types of situations. They will provide the issuing authority with their determination and report pertaining to the applicant. Note that the regulations suggest that individuals who are denied to do, due to their undetermined status will still be denied as the regulation states that no renewal or new license shall be issued by any licensing authority unless the report confirms the applicant's eligibility. So again, for those of you that have issues with being labeled undetermined because you're put on delay status, usually that's a result of like, for example, a person has a, uh, a, a criminal history incident on their record where they were arrested or detained by law enforcement for a particular violation of the law, but then there's no subsequent entry in the person's rap sheet as far as like what actually happened as a result of that. Usually, most more often than not, that typically means that the case was dropped or dismissed, but for whatever reason, the court and or the agency just failed to update the person's rap sheet with that information. And so that generally requires that the person having to go through uh, whatever records may still exist and provide the DOJ a copy with those records for DOJ to then update the person's rap sheet. But unless they do that, uh, at least here in California, that typically means that the person will get an undetermined status uh, from the DOJ. And we have been successful in, in challenging that in an administrative court process, basically, but it is it can be an expensive process and it can be difficult and therefore out of the reach of some people. But nevertheless, uh, hoping to be able to challenge that at some point here in the future. There are also requirements that uh, the regulations impose on issuing authorities. So basically, after being informed that the person is disqualified for every reason, uh, the issuing authority cannot request the EOJ to terminate the background check, subsequent notifications prior to the deadline for the applicant to request a court hearing. So again, this is just basically saying that if the applicant were to challenge it, this is giving uh, them the opportunity to uh, challenge it and then allow DOJ to provide the person with the background check information and subsequent information should it be necessary. Um, issuing authorities must review the AFS system to determine if you are in fact the recorded owner of the firearms that are sought to be listed on the license. That AFS database is something that is uh, behind what's called CLETS, 
the California Law Enforcement Telecommunications System, which is the database uh, entry system basically that allows law enforcement to look up specific records. And as generally speaking, uh, law enforcement themselves are actually prohibited from accessing these databases unless there's a legitimate law enforcement reason. And so this regulation, I think, is just giving them that authority uh, to do that here and making clear that they're the ones that have to check that to make sure that your gun is actually listed on the license. And then, of course, what it actually means to be matched. Uh, you have to have a serial number, your name, date of birth, and ID number must match the entry in AFS. And so if, for example, your name has changed or your ID doesn't match the entry in AFS because you might have moved or something like that, uh, depending on the issuing authority, how they actually apply this requirement, uh, they might require you, for example, to update your AFS records, uh, which is something that you can do. Uh, but nevertheless, it might be a problem depending on how aggressive the issuing authority wants to be in enforcing this requirement. If uh, you are denied or issued or you given an amendment or revocation, DOJ must be notified by the issuing authority for all of their uh, all of their CCW holders and CCW applicants as part of the general reporting requirements that the issuing authorities are, are, are subject to uh, here in California. And they must include copies of any new amended or renewed licenses to the DOJ and submit the annual report that's outlined in BOF uh, 1027, which is what this looks like. And so I point this out only because for those of you that remember not too long ago, the California Department of Justice uh, uh, intentionally, I will say at the very least, um, you know, some will argue unintentionally, but nevertheless, I think it was pretty uh, dumbfounding that they uh, released confidential, confidential information of all of the CCW holders here in California, including judges, prosecutors, uh, retired law enforcement, things like that. That's where this information came from, is this requirement that uh, all of the issuing authorities here in California actually provide DOJ with updates uh, as far as who's actually been issued and all that stuff uh, for a CCW. And so that's, that's the only reason why I point this out. Lastly, the California Department of Justice has imposed uh, new uh, regulations that were actually adopted fairly recently uh, regarding the ID as it's now required. So for those of you that might be familiar, uh, you uh, some, some issuing authorities would provide you both with a hard card and also a paper card that, or, or, or paper form, I should say, that was the, the paper form for the longest time was your actual CCW. But as a result of these new regulations, what DOJ is saying is the contents of that paper form must now be printed on a hard card, uh, very much like what most issuing authorities are issuing now. But this is the, the template that issuing authorities will have to use moving forward here as a result of these new regulations. And so uh, just know that if you have a CCW right now, it's not something that uh, it's like invalidating the current form that you have at the moment. Uh, but I would expect that if you are issued a license moving forward here, this is what you can expect the license itself will actually look like uh, as this is now required pursuant to DOJ regulations. If you have questions on anything that I've talked about here today, by all means, please feel free to reach out to our office, helpdesk at michellelawyers.com. Or if you have general questions regarding what efforts are, are being undertaken to challenge any of these laws, regulations, or also if you're just interested in helping out supporting the CRPA, by all means, please reach out to the CRPA. You can reach out to them at contactcrpa.org. I apologize for the misspelling there, but uh, nonetheless, you can also visit their website, crpa.org, uh, will be another uh, great resource for you. Lastly, I've talked ad nauseum here about Senate Bill 2, pretty much everything that I talked about here today is now available uh, in the new edition of the California Gun Laws book. Uh, this is now in an ebook format we, we are offering. So if, you, if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to check out uh, either the hard paper, paper bound book. We're still, my understanding is still running into issues with the printers. We have some limited availability issues with that, but nonetheless, the ebook is now available. And it's, it's, I think it's great simply because if you have a particular question or issue, it's easily searchable or you can just, you know, type control F type, you know, find what, what issue or topic you want to talk about, want to learn more about or have questions on. That'll be a great resource. And so uh, for those of you that are interested, I definitely encourage you to, uh, to check that out.
So thanks again for joining me here today, guys. I know this is a bit of a bit of a long haul today. Uh, I am planning to do more videos at some point in the future. Uh, hopefully, I'll get some more content out uh, for you guys here soon. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on the videos that I've done already regarding uh, rights restoration issues, things like that. Uh, if you guys have questions or want to see, you know, certain topics addressed, by all means, please reach out and let me know. Uh, otherwise, thanks for thanks for joining me. Uh, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys again soon.